The other thing that's going to happen in this webinar is we're going to build a feature that I actually needed when building the other plugins. Several times in the process of, of crafting code, I'll be at a place where I will, um, here let me just, I'll cancel this for now. Let's go open up our object initializer test. I'll be at a place where I will have, um, let's see. Here we go. I'll have like a block of code, like for example this, if disposing, and then inside I'll have the code, and then I'll realize, you know what, I don't really want to act on this at all. I want to get rid of this and that, delete that and delete this, and just always do this, for example. Sure. And so what, what I find myself doing is selecting this, hitting delete, coming down here, hitting delete, and then selecting the block and, you know, undenning or formatting the document. But it's a one, two, three step kind of thing. Yep. Okay. So let me undo this. So this is this is a feature that is useful in the process where you're sculpting code, right? You're, you're kind of just you know you're cranking it out. You're kind of getting this. The, the, you're, you're kind of working through the logic as you're writing it, mm -hmm. and you realize that the logic that you thought was what you were going to to, to depend upon is changed, has changed. So so yeah. th this is not a refactoring. This is a code provider. So. So, um, and, and for anybody who is uh, not familiar with those two terms, well, refactoring is you're probably familiar with it's any of the features that uh, we have available when we um, that show up in the red menu. Those are refactorings. And then code providers show up in the blue menu down here, and they can do things like change, for example, we can embed this in a try catch, change the behavior of code perhaps, for example, um, or yeah. invert the selection, for example, if that's possible to do. So, um, so, so code providers are down in blue. They are features that that intelligently manipulate code, but they might change behavior. So it's a code provider. So that's what we're going to create, and uh, and let's do that. So, um, get Express new plugin. Remove outer block. So it's going to remove this outer block, this piece, and just take all of these children and promote them. Just clicking OK for the defaults there. All right, on the toolbox, I'm going to grab a code provider and drop it on. Let's bring up the properties grid and set some properties for this. Provider name, remove outer block. Provider name is uh, needs to be unique among all the code providers that are out there. This is the display name. Um, we've seen this before. I've talked about it before, but I'll just yeah, I'll, I'll I'll say it again. This is uh, this is what shows up in the menu. This is the text that appears in the menu. You can change this. This you don't want to change. Once you create your plugin and you have a unique provider name, there you always want to keep this here. The value of having this um, uh, uh, this provider name is that you can actually um, invoke it uh, through the, um, the the shortcut dialog. So, for example, I can come in and here I've got F2 is refactor and then the parameters is rename. If I pass, if I use that same command refactor, this is this command gives you access to also all the code providers as well. I can then pass in the parameter with move outer block and then I can bind a shortcut to this particular code provider. Removes the outer code block um, while preserving and promoting, or preserving the children, and promoting them up one level. So what I mean by promoting them up one level is those, those children are now at the same depth as the parent used to be. Um, and we'll just keep this when we got a block. And now I'm going to rename the control on the form. And those are the properties. On the events, I'm going to handle apply and check availability and prepare a preview. And I'm going to need, uh, we've done similar um, plugins like this in the past. And inevitably, we discover that we need two field variables. We need one that's a string. Uh, that is going to be uh, the new code that we're generating. 
And we use this in our preview, um, in our preview hint and also in the apply. So this is the, the new code that we're generating. And then we also have uh, the deleted range. This is the code we're deleting. And this is a source range. Okay. All right, and now with that, Roy, you'll be pleased to know that we're going back to the old style of just hitting run. Excellent stuff. So some breakpoints there. So just a quick question whilst this is running up. Are we, what, what sort of things are we going to support? We're obviously going to support the if statement. Are we going to support other block structures like um, the do and the for loops, for each, things like that? Um, sure. Why not? Fair enough. You like, you like my certainty on that? <laughs> Actually, I do have one other, one other question because I know you immediately went for the if statement. Um, I'm curious to know about uh, an if with an else condition. Um, is that going to be something we're going to look at? That is an awesome question. Let's find out. I have no idea. Okay. I think it's all, I think it's all going to work. Cool. I think it's all going to work. The only you know I, in my head, Roy, I'm thinking, well, what about um, what about what happens as the parenting? Is it, are we going to have create? There may be a situation where the parent node. Let's see. Is this going to ever be possible? It used to have one, but now it has multiple. And is it going to put all braces around that? And I think with the initial code we write, that won't work. So, so, so just to be clear, let me show you what's in my mind here. So we have a condition if true, and in here we have another one, another condition, and then here we have a block of statements, S1, you know, S2, just like method calls, whatever these are going to be like this, right? Mm -hmm. So we have yep. these, and we come and start, we remove this, right? What's going to happen? We're just going to get to there, mm -hmm. or are we going to get to gotcha. there? So you have an interesting break issue, that's true. Yeah, so um, so let's just say uh, interesting test case here. We'll comment this whole thing out and we'll come back and make sure that that's inside of our code. Sure. So check availability. So let's, I'm just going to run here for a second. I want to put the carrot actually on the thing I'm interested in. Yeah, right here. Come on. Should see the breakpoint. Why is it not breaking here? Um, uh, because something is already available. I see why. Okay. So, so what what did I just do? So, just let me explain that. I I moved the carrot to the if if statement, and I was expecting the breakpoint to hit. The breakpoint did not hit, and the reason why. Let me just run it, and so you can see why it didn't hit. The reason it didn't hit is because Code Rush was able, or the DX Core was able to see another if any of the refactorings were available and it just goes through and it says okay yeah oh I found one and so it doesn't check any others it does not do an availability check anywhere else simply mm -hmm. just to get these three little dots up here so that's why when I moved away and I came back I did not get the breakpoint like I was hoping or expecting to if no other plugins were available like for example we put them up here on the try keyword now we got a breakpoint okay the other the other way that we could do that is we could is we could go back oops, let's it's going to be a little tricky. All right, let's just run it. Get the carrot down here. Come back over here. Set the breakpoint. All right, so now move up, move back. It doesn't get hit, but if we hover over this to bring the menu up, now it will check availability. On That's it. right, yeah. So it's just a performance. All we're seeing there is a performance optimization. That's why we're not calling check availability all the time on every single refactoring provider here and code provider that's out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now we are on the if statement. So let's look at this. We have EA dot elements. And what I really want to do is actually take this down to the watch. And it says it's an if. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to type in that class and just put a semicolon by it just so I can drill into it. Drilling into it. If it derives from if else. Let's drill into that. It's a conditional parent to a single statement. Let's drill into that. I'm just going up a parent to a single statement. I'm just drilling in to see the common the common ancestor. And then we're finally into parenting statement, okay, which descends from statement. So what I want to work with is a parenting statement. Does that make sense what I just did, Roy? It just does. I'm curious. I'm just remembering back to when you were originally saying. So, so the original use case is to uh, give you a one-step movement to remove the if, in this case, from around the top and the bottom, because obviously it's in a block. And then you went right. on to a, an interesting condition where you suggested there's an if statement without braces. Um, I'm wondering if we need to support that, because it's a single line as it is. Yeah? 
as a result. When you say oh, you're wondering if we need to support it, are you saying that it might work anyway, just without it? Or well, no, no, I'm just saying that you only have one line to delete there anyway. There's no. There's oh, no possible I see. That. So, so um, right. Okay. So you could just go for a, a block, a code block. Um, I forget the specific term. Um, parenting statement might be. What am I thinking here? Delimiter a capable block. Right. And you're thinking about finding where the delimiters are and deleting them is what you're thinking. Possibly, and I, we can we can go any way you like. That's 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 cool. But uh, so okay, so that is not that's different from the idea that I was thinking about doing. But I think that I I think that um, uh, I think that your idea is definitely going to work. But I have I, I I can't think of one right now. But I think there's there's going to be a similar condition case that you'll have to write code for. Okay. In other words, to check it, you're not simply going to be able to take those those elements and remove them. So, um, or, or remove the piece minus the, the braces. Um, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, here's, I can't actually think of it. Hold on a second. The case is something like, um, uh, so, so here, let's uncomment this piece right here again. So the idea is if we remove this, we're suggesting, well, what if we just deleted it and then we kept the braces underneath? And then the, the edge case situation is this, is now, okay, we delete it and then we have that, okay? And so, so what we have to do in that case is check to see is are we already in braces, and if so, delete those as well, like this. Yes, yes, that's fair okay. enough. Yeah. So we have, regardless of whether we take a stab at it using your approach or the the approach that I'm going to suggest, which is we simply just take this the piece we're on and all its children and just replace that with its children. That's the that's the approach I was going to take. It mm -hmm. seems like regardless of which, which, which approach we take, we're still going to have to do a check later, a logic check, to see if a particular condition exists. And if yeah. it does, we need to handle that condition. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, so let me just undo this a bit. So, so we were talking back here of parenting statements. So we want to say uh, ea.element as parenting statements, hit the code rush key, declare local. We want to come down in here, get out of there, if it's null. And then we're going to say ea.available equals, doing some, uh, well actually we just say true. I was thinking about doing something like this, parenting statement dot has block, mm -hmm. but then I was thinking I kind of wanted to also work on single node pieces like this. In other words, if I'm here, why not have it just work and simply give me that? Sure. You know, why not make it just an easy way to get rid of, of, of parents that have a single child? Right. That's what this has block is about right here. Does it have um, a block of code underneath it. I'm pretty sure that's correct. But anyway, I'm just going to say available is true. Okay, so there we go. Let's just run it. And now we should see uh, remove outer block, prepare preview. Let me just clear that breakpoint so we can just see it. Then let's do it show one more time. Remove outer block. There you go. Removes the outer code block by preserving the children and promoting them up one level. So there you go. So we don't have the preview hint yet, so we need to build that. That's like the next state, next piece. But at least it's available here. Let's see. You had a question on. Um, well, you had a question about the else. Let's do this. Let's put a message of log. Um, suppose it is false. So we'll set up this line of code here in the else as well, and and then we'll. Uh, I wanted to show up here and try. The move outer block is available on the try. Okay, so it sees that it's a parenting statement, right? A statement that can sure. parent others. It is not available or should not be available here because this is not a statement. Right? So it's not a, it's not available on the um, on the on the method itself, even though it has a child block, um, yeah. because it's not a statement. So it's only available on statements that have not children. Is it available on the catch, I wonder? I bet it is. Yeah, there you go. It's available on the catch as well. Which is a little tricky, right? If you are on the catch, you don't only want to get rid of this, but you want to get rid of this and that as well, right? So arguably, if you're talking about parallel blocks, so in the case of both the else and the if, or sorry, the if right, and if else here. and the try catch, you want to get rid of not just the parent to the current block, but any of the parent siblings. That's kind of what I think. I guess you could also argue that, well, if you were here, you might just want to do this instead is what you might want to do. So you just remove the else itself. Yeah. And we could write it so it did do that. But what yeah. I'm going to do instead is I'm going to make it so that if you're here or here, it does the same thing. And it gets rid mm -hmm. of this block and unindents it. 
And, and if we decide that that's not as useful as the other, then we can change it. Sure. Okay, so with that, let's go back and let's work on the prepare, prepare preview. So let's break point here. Let's get the permission faculty key. Let's highlight it. And now we have this lovely dial, this lovely menu hiding, hiding our uh, uh, workspace. So in the prepare preview, so we we essentially have. I think we're going to start with this bit of code here as well. So we'll have that, and then we want to do a couple things. So we have the delete range, right? We say delete range equals parenting statement dot range. I'm just going to delete the whole parenting statement, okay? At least to start out with. Well, probably I, I'm I'm you know already with this example right here. We're mm -hmm. going to have to. This is not going to work, I'm realizing. Also, with the tried catch, this is not going to work either. But we're going to start with this for now. Um, so we, there's our range. Our new code, so what we want to do is this. We want to create a new element builder. Code is factor key, get, it, get the variable declared for us. We need to go into the parenting statement, and we need to go through, iterate through all of its children. So let's look at this. Let's go back up here. We'll uncomment this out. Let's go into tool in this so you can see what this looks like visually. Bring up the expressions lab. And, and so um, so let's see, what was I what was my purpose of taking us here? I'm like I'm looking at the range and the new element. Oh the nodes. I wanted to show you the child nodes. So if we're here, if we're here and we look at the way this works here. You see the children of this outermost div is, is it has two sets of children. One that's in blue, which are the detail nodes, and the other are the nodes, the child nodes themselves, which is here. This itself has a detail node in blue right up here, and there's mm -hmm. you can see the detail node. And then the, the node, the children, the, 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 the nodes themselves are not. So how do I say this? We have two different sets of children. One is called nodes, and the other is called detail nodes. The detail nodes are as you can see, not direct children, nothing that we'd want to promote. However, the regular nodes are, see, they're in black here. Typically, so, the way it works is that the detail node is part of the item, is intrinsically part of it. So the if statement doesn't yes. really exist without a condition, whereas the yes. nodes are sort of child items of the block. They're kind of optional. You could have an if statement that did nothing when the condition was true. It's not necessary in order to compile. Um, yeah, so, Rory? So that, that's kind of a... I was just going to say, Rory, I love you being here. It's you always come in and save me with a better description than than I come up with, and I and I love it. It's great. All right. So what we want to do is in the, we want to go with the iterate through the, the nodes here. So we're going to say uh, for each uh, language element um, element in these nodes, and um, you know we should talk just a little bit. I'm assuming that these language elements are these are all these elements are going to be language elements. It's it's probably more correct to say I element, which is this, you know, ancestor interface. And the reason why is it's possible, well, I'm not sure with the with statements if it's possible to do this, but I know with other with other nodes properties, um, it's not always guaranteed to be a language element inside of it. However, if we're talking about the active document, the document that's active, um, you can pretty much rely on that. Um, actually, let me rephrase, let me omit the word pretty much. You can rely on that always being a language element because um, the difference between an I element and a language element is that we might have these lightweight objects out there in the nodes um, array. We might have those and those the purpose of the lightweight objects are to um, uh, allow us to, to process and consume very little memory and process very quickly um, uh, the code that's out in the background, the files that are on disk. So the way I'm starting to look at this myself is I'm, I'm almost always going with the I element version because I never know when the code I'm writing will later be moved and used in a document that isn't the active document. Fair enough. Good point. So we'll just go with I element. In fact, I've just recently had that exact problem. I wrote a very large algorithm to rebuild a huge class on the yeah. assumption that the input would be a real class that was the active document. And yeah. I'm I'm having to rewrite the whole thing because I'm doing it in terms of an I element, a class that I don't have the full details of, which actually is part of the framework and I don't have the source code at all. I see. And uh, had I written it with I element in, in mind in the first place, I wouldn't have that problem now. And we have a, you know what, the only method I need to call anyway is clone. So, uh, 
so I'm, I'm, I'm good here. Uh, I don't want to do this though. Uh, I want to say, I think there's an option to clone. Or maybe not. Maybe not what I'm thinking. Let's see what these options are. Mm -hmm. Looks like it's going to take more. Looks like it's a class is what it is. New. So we got clone nodes, clone regions, clone up to members. Interesting. Oh, got a. Uh, can you give me? I just want to. I'm going to uh, send this over to you. Can you give me this as a reminder? Um, we have a spelling in this. Yeah, um, I see that. Just send it over to you, so we'll fix that. Um, we have a nice refactoring called safer name. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with, I'm going to skip these these options, just go with the default on the clone on this. But I do think I want to come in here and I want to say uh, as uh, as a language element, do I want to do this as a language element? Let me, let's see what element builder takes in here. Cause what, I, what I really am wanting to get to is a call to add node. And the parent's sure. going to be null and the child has to be a language element. So, so yeah. So uh, I see, it. fair enough. So just as a quick reminder to people, the reason why we're cloning this in the first place is because if we attempt to move, or to, to <laughs> I guess that's the key, isn't it? If we add a node to something, it will try and reparent that. And under the covers, that will confuse uh, the DX core and will make it think it's moved somewhere. So you will have code started off. In this case, it would be a child statement of an if. And you'll be what you think you're doing is you're copying it somewhere else. But in actual fact, you'll do it a move. And that will thoroughly confuse things. So we make a clone of it and add that as the child of the new item. That's correct. So that's what we're doing. And then we're going to come down here and we're going to say element builder dot generate code and what are my options here? Language ID. Yeah, I think we're good. We can just go with that. And actually this is going to be the, our new code um, field that we've already put up at the top. And then now that we've got done both of those, we can go into the event args. So event args dot add code preview. And uh, in here, this location is going to be the delete range dot uh, start. And you know, I should I, every time I write code where I work with a range, and I come in and I type in start, I always think the same thing, and I never tell you the thing I'm thinking. And I'm going to now tell you what I'm thinking every time I get in here. Is I think well, you know, I could also use top. And the difference between start and top is this. Um, uh, for a well, first let me say that source range, this class, the, this the struct that we're working with, your source range, it it can be used for selections as well. So watch this as I select from here and I move to the left, and I move up to the top, right there. Here, the start of the selection is here, and the ah. end is here. Right, so start to end would be reversed. However, if we yeah. use top, it's always guaranteed to be the one closest to the top of the document. So top is the earliest point out of the selection in the document, whereas uh, start need not be. It can be a sort of a reverse selection, as you indicate well, there. Right. However, when we're talking about the ranges for for nodes from our parser, they are always the start and top will always be the same. Okay. And so other, if you get yeah. the name range for any ent entity that has a name, start and top will be the same in that case because you've been handed this name range by the DX core. Exactly. As opposed to getting it from a select that somebody might have manually created. Exactly. And also bottom and end will be the same in that case as well. So I've never actually said that, but that's, that's what I've been thinking every time. In fact, what I probably should be doing is using top instead, I suppose, right? Because I want, yeah. you know, just... Just, you know, the same kind of reason why you want to use item and above. In the event that I might move this code, I might worry about the selections or something like that. Mm -hmm. okay. so, um, so we'll go ahead and do that. We'll say top instead of start. But I, 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 I've always used start up to this point. So, so we're going to add a code preview, which is going to put this new code that we've generated in up there at the top of the delete range. And then we can come in and say ea.addStrikeThrough and just pass in the delete range. Right there. And now clear breakpoint and run and see if that works. Okay, so here we go. Let's bring it up again. We move out our block. I hold down the control key to get rid of the hinting, and so we see this. All right, so what it's going to do, you can see there it's going to promote the children. It's going to remove that outermost piece right there. That's what it's going to do. 
So um, not bad, but our else is kind of screwed. But let's go ahead and uh, let's pretend for a moment that we don't have the else. Let me just comment that out. To get that quickly, I use selection increase followed by the slash key. That's all I did to comment the block out. Nice. Let's go ahead and hit apply or remove out of block. And here's what we want to do here. We want to come in and say, so notice we've got all these preview hints up here. Um, just wrote this breakpoint. So we're going to say EA text document dot and we're going to work with queued edits because we need to do two things. We need to do a delete and we need to do an insert. We want them both to happen with the same undo operation. And so queued edits are a great way to work with a single text document and make multiple changes and have them all undone or redone with a single operation. So we're going to say say queue delete and we're going to pass in the range that we want to delete, the delete range. And then we're going to say ea.textdocument.q insert, and we want to specify where we're going to insert, so we're going to be the, the, uh, the top, just at the top for now, of, of, the, uh, of that, of, of the delete range, and then the new code, which will be there. I think it's a good idea just to introduce the idea that the, these queued um, operations are particularly good only when you use, every operation you do is relative to the known start point, not relative to the previous operation because we will adjust, the DX core will adjust each of these as each one is done. So if you have a, an operation one that applies at the top of the document and an operation two that happens a little lower down, the act of doing operation one may remove code or add code, making sure the DX core will then have to offset the second operation to make sure it happens in that given location. If you wanted to sort of imagine in your head, you do operation one and you know that subtracts three lines and you're then going to add the second operation and with that in mind, you're going to duplicate the effort by the DX core and you'll actually have a, a, a bit of an offset problem there, maybe six lines, uh, and things will go a little bit astray. So, yeah, so, Roy, you know, I was kind of thinking about other things while you were talking, as I sometimes do, but the essence of what I think you were just saying was use queue deletes instead of um, actually deleting text and inserting text. You have multiple things that you need to do on a particular file um, because, because the DX core is going to do those in the correct sequence so that your delete doesn't then change the line ranges for the next bit you want to operate on later on. Is that what mm -hmm. you were saying? Yeah. So say, for, yeah. for example, if we wanted to delete this range and then this range, notice this range starts at line 48, but if we were to delete this first, we'd be removing three lines, which means that would now start, it would look like this, we'd go like that, and now we went to line 48 or 50, whatever, and now we would delete this part instead of our intended bit, which was right here. See, so that's what that's what Roy's talking about. So yeah, use the queue, delete queue, and search. All right, so let's run that. And okay, so the code is correct, but it's not formatted correctly. If I control K D, it'll format the document. And there's my undo right there, remove out of block. So I needed to reformat. So so let's go back over here. We'll set a breakpoint here, and we will apply one more time. Remove out of block. And there's a parameter that's available here called format. And it'll just format that range for you automatically. In fact, all the ranges that are modified in this through these queued areas will be reformatted for you. Not the entire document, but just the pieces that we've changed. So it's a nice little handy way to, to reformat everything. And so now the code should be lined up correctly, and you can see it is. Okay, so that's step one. Step two is what happens when we get here? Let's uncomment this piece. We do this, we move out a block we can see we're going to have a problem. We have this else that is lining up incorrectly. It's lining up with this child instead of this other piece. We need to get rid of the else as well. If we get rid of this, we have to get rid of its, its other piece. We could make it, Rory, so that if you're here, it gets rid of just this one. But if you're at the top, it gets rid yeah. of... So it'd be kind of this sibling and further siblings. Right. So we could do that. So let's, let's look at how we fix that. So up the uh, expressions lab. And let's put the carrot on the else keyword. So here you can see there we're on the else. You can see that it's a sibling to the if. So there's the if and there's its sibling. Okay. So conceptually an if else, those are siblings. What if we put up on the try? Its siblings are catch and finally. 
Okay? It doesn't make sense to make catch a child a tribe, or finally a child a tribe. It doesn't make sense. It's a sibling to it. Okay? However, it's a special kind of sibling. In fact, I think there's a property in here called completes previous. There it is. Boom. True if this language element connects to the previous statement or processor, preprocessor directive. Okay? So if we're here on the catch, completes previous is going to be uh, true. Should be true. Where is it? There it is. But if we're up on the try, completes previous doesn't make sense there. Okay? So one way that we could work on this is we could say, okay, let's see what its siblings are and see if its very next code sibling is completes previous, right? And if it is, then it's, it's attached to it, okay? So that's one way to, to, that we could, we could manipulate this. Let's, however, go back over here. We got the breakpoint. Let's come in here and, and get the removal out of, rib, uh, out of block. Let's go here, parenting statements. Let's look at what methods we have. Get, so a couple of these. And I think we I don't know if we've used these in the past where I feel like we you and I have talked about these, but get full block cut range. I feel yeah. like we've talked about this. And what this I does do is have. yeah, it gets a source range that includes partnering elements, um, including leading and trailing white space, right? So this whole concept of get full block essentially goes out and grabs things. You've got also get full block coordinates, and then you have get uh, full block nodes, which will, if you, um, if you look at this, will, it has two out parameters here, start node and end node. Also block elements, I'm not sure what that is, we'll take a look at that. So this is what I'm looking at, I'm interested in, get full block nodes right here. I can also get get full block range as well, but the idea is I want to get the nodes, all the nodes that are part of this block. So if I'm on an if-else, I want the if and the else node. And then I want to evaluate those, find the children for each of those, and then add them to the element builder. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So you're going to have an if-else, if two blocks, as it were, and you're going to add both sets of children. So you're actually going to eliminate just the if structure around them and do both preceding sets of operations. I'm going to, yes, I'm going, to, I'm going to eliminate the if and the else. That's okay. what I'm going to do. So we're going to say out, start node, out, end node. And then we're going to come up here, hit the code of key, declare local, come over here, declare local. And so now we have start node and end node. Now we want to do something like this. We want to say uh, um, element check equal start node. <coughs> We want like a while loop here, I think. Um, while uh, not null, then we want to come in here and we want to say, uh, let's just check as parenting statement. Let's call this the parent. And we want to say, if that's not null, then we want to, Here, let's make, move element builder up. And let's then take this for loop and put it in here. But since you're working with parenting statement, we work with parent. I might do something here too, if not null, just to make sure that this as actually works, the clone is working there. So well, there was another parameter here, though. What was that one? The block elements. It's the starting language elements for the block. What was the block? Wait, the block elements to take into account is what it says. That's what I'm reading right down there. Let's see what that is. Block elements. So I suspect, is that an enumeration, a flag of enumeration? So different types of piece that you can include? Yeah, that's what it is. So you can get, I think by default, you get everything. Yeah. So. Certainly most okay. things. Interesting. I'm just going to not. I'm not going to mess with that. But if you wanted to, just grab pieces of it. You could. So there's there's our get full block nodes call, and well, element to check is not null. Do this, and then I want to say element to check gets its next sibling. You say element to check equals uh, next sibling. I'm going to say next sibling so we can get comments as well. Because, you know, I don't know. I'm wondering if like XML.comments could apply to nodes as well. Does that make sense or not? Maybe not. 
I, I just talked myself out of it. I'm going with Nick's code sibling. So it gets the next non-comment sibling to this element, or null if no siblings contain code following this element. All right, so there's our elements so check. We're gonna, I'd like yes. to point out to people again, this is not a refactoring. We are not building a refactoring. We are most definitely changing the logic of your code. Right. So those wondering about um, when we eliminate this, how are we going to account for, for example, you've got a catch block which might declare an, an exception, which EX, the declaration of that won't exist. So if you've got code referencing it inside the catch, that will not compile anymore. But that is expected with this particular operation. Right, or, or if we had a for loop for and we now. took got rid of it and the iterator was used inside of there. That's right. right. Yeah. So we can, you know, yes, the answer is, is yes, it may end up breaking code. We could actually check for these things, see if anything in the expression is used inside and either make it not available or, you know, make it available with some, some kind of warning or something along those lines. Sure. So, so all right, so I think th this, is, this is what, we want something that looks like this. I, while you were talking, I added this line of code here. So, so we're, we're getting the next sibling. If the elements check is equal to the end node, then we just break to get out. Mm -hmm. okay, so we're going to go through, find all of between here and here, between the start node and end node. So get full black node, these should be siblings. They absolutely should be. Um, if they're not, then we've got a problem with the parser or, or, this, or there's perhaps something that I'm not considering as a, as a possibility here. Um, but, 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 um, but with the languages I am uh, familiar with, C sharp, C plus plus, and BB, um, these are going to be siblings. What, what were you going to say, Rory? So we're expecting uh, get full block nodes to be the highest level nodes in the block. Yes. So you won't yes. get any detail nodes. We're not going to get the nodes inside of the if statements, the if block. Right. We're just going to get the if and the else in this particular example, or the try and catch finally. So, so, so I've just stepped over this. Start node is an if. See it right there, if. Yep. And then end node should be the else. There it is. It's the else. Okay? Good. Yep. All right. So let's continue through here. Well, I'm going to check it's not null. There's the if. Uh, if, if, if this succeeds. So we have a parent. We're going to go through all its children. Like that. And we're not equal to the end node. Now we get the next sibling. Element to check is now the else. We go through this. Grab that that log statement that was in there. It'll just be one. Now element to check is equal to end node. It is break and we're out. Oh, but look here. We're, the delete range is wrong, mm -hmm. right? It's just going to be the range of the of the if. So what we need to do instead is we need to say a new source range. By the way, I'm going to now right click on source range. I'm going to say use type in templates and Hmm, SR is already used somewhere else. By the way, here's another note to devs right here, Rory. Yep. I want to see I what... I know exactly what this is going to oh, be. Oh, <laughs> well, here it is right here. If I hover over it, it tells me it's IO Stream Reader. Uh, okay. I'm going to change it to SRG. Okay, so I'll just do this. So now, from, from this, if you're watching these Coder Feature webinars in sequence, you will now see that in the future, instead, whenever I want a source range, I'm going to just use SRG to get it. So we'll yep. do add right there like that. So now it's our G's there. Okay, so hovering over is not bad, but I really would like that. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. So, you know what I'm talking about? I would like it to just, do. it's already taken, like L. I'd like it to just say here in the dialog. Instead, I have to hover over this to see what you to see what mm -hmm. I is equal to. Okay. All right, so we want a new source range, and we're going to grab the start node. Whoops, that's not it. The start node dot top. Oh, come on, dot range dot top. Right seeking with uh, and then the end node dot range dot bottom. And so now the, our delete range is now fully encompassing. Okay? Let's see what the new code is like. So let's actually run it because we can see it. Alright, let's do it again, bring it up. Oops, I don't want this one. Um, so what happens is it goes away because it lost focus. Here we go. So now you can see it looks like this. So whoops, take a, take a so look. So you see the pieces inside of each section there. So there's the dispose logic inside of the if, and there's the log logic inside of the else. They're both being right. replicated inside the preview now. Exactly. And then so we can go... test, just oh. do both. Yeah. <laughs> now, let's do... Let's solve that other problem. So now we have this code. 
and I want to remove this, right? Here, I'm pretty sure we have a problem. Yeah, we've just changed logic. We really, we want to do, what we want to do here is we want to wrap it up in a block, is what yeah. we want to do. And I guess there are two ways to do this. One, which I'm kind of leaning towards, is to also check to see if the parent is, is uh, the parent of a single statement, a single child. Okay? And, and I think not only that, but we also need to see if it's inside of um, braces or not. Um, yeah. Because if it's in braces, not a big deal. But, but so, so, and I, let's go in, I'm pretty sure we have a property on this. And here, let's move this we'll see a little bit more. So here's our if statement here, and I'm just not remembering the prop property right here. Has block is true. Um, I think it might be sort of P for parents. Parents. Nope, I'm not seeing that either. Um, is that something to do with block code range or something similar derivation? No, there's. I think that. And, there's a single property that says, do you have only a single child? And it may has be this part right block? here. Has block may be false. So let's see if we take this out and see what happens. So we delete this, we delete this. If has block goes to false, then that's the property we can use. Yeah, it does. There we go. Okay. So has block is false and then um, and node count Oops, hold on here. Let's go back over here. What's your node count? Node count is uh, is greater than uh, greater than one. Greater than zero. I mean, yeah. Okay. So so the idea does it have ch children? I wonder if we have a has children. So that would be nice if we could use that. No, we don't. We could do node. We could do node count. So the the, the logic was something like this. Um, the, the special case logic goes like this. If we need to get to the parent of this parenting statement. So here, let me block right here. And let's put the parent here. I think key. it's just has block because by definition, if it's our parent, it's got a child. Um, true. That's true. Whoops, I hit copy. There we go. Just took a second to get back. All right. So, um, so... I think I want to still typecast it to a parenting statement and assume that that's the case. Because if it's not a parenting statement that is a method, then we should be okay with that. And then we're going to, we're going to call this the grandparent. Root that. And then we're going to say if that's not null, then we want to say if grandparent dot not has block. Mm -hmm. Hold on a second. I want to go in because I, I want to get back in here. But it, let's go. If else, initial parent to single, initial parent to single statement, parent to single statement. That's what I want to typecast it as. Because if it's not a parent to single statement, then it's not a big deal. So let's do this instead. Change this type to there. And if we're not null, and if the grandparent has blocked, then we are in this special case scenario where we have to deal with this. So let's just hit run and see what happens. There, we're here. Okay. So, so, or, yeah, we don't have a block. And, and so what we need to do now is we need to actually say, okay, um, we are, uh, let's do one other thing. I think it's going to make this totally easy. Scoop this easy or not? Let's do this. Language element, um, this is going to be, the uh, parent to replace, we'll set that equal to null. But here, we'll set that equal to grandparent. And then what we'll do is in our element builder, we'll add, you know, called add null, add node, we'll add it to the parent to replace, which could be null, which is okay, they're all top level, or it could be the parent to replace. Oops, I need to clone this. Don't ever let me do this again, right? <laughs> okay? Um, 
So uh, you're changing the level at which we're doing the replace, and you're adding the clone of the original into the list of items we're going to replace with. Yes, I am. And so when this add node will okay. either add to that parent or just at the top level of the element builder. Okay. And then what we need to do is down here in delete range, we need to do this. We need to say if the parent replace is not null, then delete range is equal to um, parent to replace dot uh, range, else it's that. And I think that's all we have to do. And it'll Did work. you add the parent into the list of nodes? In the element builder. I did not. Uh, and I need to do that. So we need right. to do, uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. We have to add that. And that's, again, why you're here, Rory. It's not null. Parent place is not null. Then we're going to say, oops, I'm going to go down here. We're going to say, Element builder dot add node null comma parent replace. So this is also why it's very useful to use a, a queue of operations and, and a list of nodes. We're not having to do we're not doing a replace so much as we are doing a delete and an insert. And we wrap them all in a single um, a single operation later on anyway, so it won't matter. Um, but it's very much easy to keep separate in your head. You say, well, I'm going to delete the entire structure and just before I do that, I will have added a specific list. So first of all, the original parenting statement, then each of the relevant children that I want to have in this final output, and then you go through and say, well, I'll delete that bit, now I'll replace with this bit, all done. And well, let's move it down here so we can see this. Looks like it goes slightly off screen. Yeah. What's going on here? Oh, 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 we oh. We replaced what we thought we did. No, we, we are, but the problem is in, um, is in our clone call. We're cloning everything, and we just and 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 what we need to do now after cloning ah. is we need to remove all its children. <laughs> yes. Okay. This is good. Because it's actually cloning the children. It's a deep clone. It is, and there might be a way too to to change the parameters to the clone. Okay, that one. Yes. Yeah. Okay, this is what one where we we trick it. Let's see if I don't, I don't know. We can try playing with those only clone options. Oh, this is the one we had before. Let's just see what if we can make this work. I've never I've never worked with this before, so we'll see what we can do. Clone options dot clone nodes. I'm going to set that to the false. Right. Yeah. Let's see what happens just with that change right there. Okay. Boom. 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 Parent replaces the if, and do we have Let's see what its nodes are. Dot node count. Is it zero? I think it's zero. It's zero. Excellent. All right, so that might be all we need to do. All right, so let's look at it again. And there it is. Look at that. So That's it is working. We're rid of the if disposing. We're maintaining the if true, and we've gone rid of the else clause from the if disposing. It's exactly as we wanted it. I like it. I like it. Okay, so that's not bad. So let's uh, let's apply cool. that. Let me hit undo. Let's put the carrot here and hit the key. And let me hit undo. Watch what happens here, though. The try block is not removed. That's and done. Hang on. That's all. Let's set a breakpoint. Let's set a breakpoint in apply. That's looking like it did exactly what we did before, despite having moved somewhere else. Yes. Let's set a breakpoint in prepare preview. Hit the key. Oh. We go straight to apply. So we're doing this work where we're we're writing code in prepare preview. But because here, when the caret is on the try statement, it's the only thing available. We have no other refactorings available on a try statement, at least in this oh, case. Very good. Yes, okay. That's good. It, skips, it skips the prepare preview and just uses the data we already very have, the delete range, right? In fact, if we hadn't hit undo, watch this. Let's go back over to it and we hit undo. Or, or I'm sorry, here. Let's do this here. We move out our block. So there's the prepare preview. Can I do this without the? Well, let's just do this. Whoops! Hit run from the wrong application. We move out a block. Let's get rid of that breakpoint. So we actually, there we go. So we move out a block. So now we're not going to hit undo. And now we come up here and hit it, and 
hit it again, and now we're getting into this correct yeah, mangly space. code left, right, and center. So just to go right. over that slowly once again, just in case people didn't follow it, normally what happens if you've got two or three refactorings um, available in a single location is obviously we pop up a menu to let you choose which one. And as you hover over each one of them, you get a little preview in some cases. That's where we're doing the logic in this case. However, if there's only one option available and you just hit the code rush refactor key, default options say that we don't put up the menu at all and we just go straight ahead and do it which means we skip over that part of the logic that bothers to calculate what we're going to delete. And since we've got leftovers from the previous instance, we start deleting code in all kinds of places we didn't want to do. Right. So what we need to do is we need to refactor. Um, one other thing that I, I'm not a fan of is, 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 is if I do hover over this, by the way, and remove outer block, um, this is, I, I've got to do this so you can see more on screen. All right. So, so here, notice it's actually bringing in log exception found. That's what's inside the catch right here. It's bringing this piece up. I'm actually of the mindset that if we are, if we, for this to be useful, we should ignore anything that's parented by a catch. I think that I think that if we're, you know, the, 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 if we have a try finally or a try catch, we want to remove the try. We just want to take this up, move it to the left, and also the finally if there's anything there, because that's important. With the exception, we don't want to put that logic here. That just that just is going to be deleted. Okay. okay. So so we want to. I want to make one change to that, and then we're going to we'll shut down and re refactor. So it's that change. Is here, I think. So it goes like this. So it's all about things you now don't add to the list of nodes which you're going to use in the insert. Here, there's the try. Let me hit run. Now we should get to the catch. So now what I want to do is I want to say and uh, parent dot element type um, is not equal to language element type dot catch. And so now that okay. should effectively eliminate it. Yeah, just skipped over it. All right. So now we will show that preview. This is other things in it bugging me is we have an empty line at the end over here as well. So, you know, I almost, can, Roy, can you take a screenshot of this? Uh, so this is, yep. So, so just let's send me the screenshot. This is happening because we're on a low, we, we, we've only got like 768 pixels vertically. And so we're, we're, we're trying to figure out where to put this. And so we crop some of this. I think we need to do a better job of, of in this low, uh, in small monitor situation. So this would be a note to devs. I want, I'd like to improve this. Okay, so um, so so now if we bring this up though, so we remove outer block on it, we don't have the exception found. You see, that's not showing up there. Only have this bug. So we do that, and then we get from here. So, but here's that extra empty line. That's the thing I was I was just noticing. Let's clear that out as well. And that happens here when we generate code. And so let's do this. So I think I know what that is, that, that extra line. That is due to the range you're calculating. But you can use, in fact, if you go back up to where we get the, was it the get lock nodes, a little before this section, um, we could at that stage capture the get cut block or get block cut range. And the, the cut range is an interesting one because it takes the, the uh, white space before and after the sets of nodes that you're interested in as well and, and will allow you to cut and replace those. Well, here's so you the thing that calculated up there. This is coming back from a call to generate code, and in, sometimes this is useful if we're going to insert. Like we, if we have, if we wanted to insert that code between here and here, we just put the carrot there and say insert, and that extra carriage return at the end will guarantee that whatever code's inserted is in that range right there, and and uh, and this line runs down as opposed to it being. Let me, let me demonstrate this. Here, if I don't have it at the end, and I come in here and I paste, you get this. Right where you have two statements on one line, right? That's right. Yeah. right. And so what 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 the, the the generate code call does is is uh, uh, is what 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 I would call intentionally is it adds that extra character return at the end. We've seen this before. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say new code dot ends with um, enl for. Is there an option not line. to generate it? Yeah, I don't think so. Proceeding wide space count. That's it. Just those three. Uh, I must be thinking of the internal versions. Fair enough. So then we're going to say, and there's also generate elements as well. There's some other generate calls. So maybe there is something else that has that option. But we're going to say new code. So new code dot remove. Uh, pass in new code dot link minus enl dot link. 
got. And that should get rid of that extra empty line. Let's put the carrot here. Boom, boom. Let's run it. Let's bring that up one more time because we lost focus. Oops. We'll do that space smaller so we can see it all. So here we move out of block. Now we don't have that empty line at the end. That's good. Okay. So, so, it, so we, we still have to fix that one problem, right, because we're, we're generating code through the preview. But the idea is this. If I have some code here like this, I can remove that outer block. I can say, okay, let's remove this outer block as well. And let's even come down here. Let's remove the if disposing outer block. We'll see, oh, disposing is false, but we can now get rid of that if we want to because that was from the else. And then, and then we can even come up here and let's say, let's remove this outer block. We get to just simply this. Right, so you can see in the process of sculpting code where you might be like, you know, where this might be useful, right? Where you've been yeah. at a point where you've said, oh, well, I need to have this check, and then you realize later the check isn't necessary, for example. And, and to answer your question, yes, it works with it, you know, else, and it also works in this parenting issue. So the only thing we have to solve is the problem of what happens when we just hit it here if we've already used it somewhere else. So for that, we're going to need to do some refactoring, so let's close this down. And, uh, and now what we want to do is we want to take this whole block of code, probably from here down to here, and we'll extract that as its own method. So extract that out, and we're going to call this uh, calculate code. And you know what? I'm going to take this and come in here and do this. And I'm also going to say at the beginning of this new code is null. Okay? So there's calculate code. So we can come in here and line that temp. All right, so now our prepare preview looks like this. Then what we can do is we can come up in our apply. And also this interesting test case looks like we've handled this, so I'm going to go back. In our apply, we can say if the new code equals null, then calculate code as an EA dot element as parenting statement. Won't we have to do the calculation regardless because we could have new code hang up from previous run? Like that. I don't think so because ah. I can set it to no right here. Because <laughs> you just changed it. Excellent. Yes. So just change the code. No, that's good. It's a great point. I mean, well, you could do this every time if you wanted to, every single time. Um, well, that's, that's and and it's more. really not going to, it, from, a, from a performance standpoint, it's, it's undetectable, right? The user will not be able to tell the difference. Um, mm -hmm. From an efficiency standpoint, I like to kind of go more along this lines and have code that looks like this. Sure. But let's run it and, and, um, and check it out. We, uh, I think we satisfied the constraints. I think we're going to have a, uh, a useful feature and done in an hour. And uh, Matt is probably very happy about that. And um, what else? Mostly DX core stuff, right? It's all yeah, it's pretty much absolutely. all DX core. I mean, to be clear, this will now probably work with with do loops, with for each loop, with just basic for loops. Probably even work with a switch statement. Oh, I haven't even thought about a switch statement. Let's try that. Yeah. So, so let's go in and we'll say, uh, um, here, we'll do this. We'll cut that to the clipboard. I'll type in, uh, I'll come in here, I'll type in W space, get a while loop, fall true. We'll come down in here and we'll paste that in. So now if we want to get rid of the while loop. There we go. We move out of block. It's the only thing available, so it just did it. Okay. Yep. Move out of block. The only thing that's interesting is it's putting the caret at the end of the, um, of the, and I kind of think I wanted the carrot at the beginning. Yeah. Of the child block that we that we create. I mean, there's an argument that we should maybe detect which end you're at, because um, you could well, be at either, and technically you'd be. Um, capable this is only of it, from the end. Well, I don't think it's available from the end. Let's see if it is. Holy cow, it is. Interesting. Okay, yeah, I guess it does make sense because it is. I'm technically on that block. I don't know about C-sharp, but VB allows you also to, to have the specification of when you exit the while loop at the bottom end of the loop rather than at the top. So there's, there's certainly cases where that might be the... Right. So in C-sharp, we have a do while, which does that. We have a do while. Okay. So you can get that. You, you can do that here by typing in DW for do while. 
and it looks like this. Yeah. And the block is in there. So, um, so let's see. For, so, so Rory is thinking, well, all these carrots at the beginning of the end. Um, it's a very minor issue, though. I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, the code has been removed. Um, I can't let it go. An I'm exercise to the viewer. <laughs> yeah, let's, yeah let's, let's give it a shot. Hooked you. And and if we can solve it in the one line of code, then we're good. And uh, you know, otherwise, we'll uh, we'll leave it as an exercise for you. So let's set a breakpoint here. Um, so let's go in here, hit this, and I think what I want to do so is let's come in here and say ea dot text document dot um, carrot. Oh, come on, I gotta go to the view, don't I? Um, after view, I think you can go to code rush dot carrot. Code rush dot carrot dot move. All right, fine. Possible. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to do this. <laughs> That's one of the nice things about the DX Core is it, it, there are genuinely a, a couple of ways at least to do most things. Um, so it helps with people maybe approach problems in different ways. Now remember Rory was talking about having multiple deletions or insertions that might change the line numbers. Because we only have one, we can actually use delete range dot top. We don't have to worry about that changing. So so that should this should work. So let's try this. Let's switch over here. And yeah, so there we go. Carrots up at the top. So we go here, we do it again, remove out a block, do it again, remove out a block. See, it, it's kind of nice that way, right? Now I don't have to move so much, remove out a block. Okay, so now with that, um, the feature is done. Uh, any questions? Do you have any questions from folks out there? Uh, let's have a quick look. Um, I think we've covered most things. Um, okay. Yeah, these, these were all talking about uh, things we've covered, basically, so yeah. Amanda. Uh, normally, yes. I, normally I give Amanda a lot more warning. Normally I say, well, <laughs> then I guess we'll wrap it up and switch to Amanda in a moment as soon as I finish my sentence. And then she'll have her mic turned on by then. Amanda. Yes. Take us out of here, my friend. Awesome. Uh, thank, you. thank you, guys. So, all right, we have a whole lineup of webinars uh, posted through October. We have amazing guest presenters and, of course, DevExpress product training. So check them out and register at devexpress.com slash webinars. Tomorrow, mastering ASP.NET grid view, filtering, and multiple checkboxes. Learn how to add a multiple checkbox column to allow your end users to filter more powerfully. Also, we want your feedback. We are always looking to improve and want to target topics that our customers in the developer community are interested in. If you have feedback or suggestions on topics you'd like to see, please email me at webinars at devexpress.com. And again, if you have a feature idea for Mark, and Rory, shoot Rory an email at RoryB at DevExpress.com or tweet it, including hashtag CodeRush. All right, if you missed anything from this webinar or you want to review any previous webinars or check out hundreds of online product tutorials, please visit us on the DevExpress channel at tv.devexpress.com. Again, thanks so much to Mark and Rory. Thank you all for joining us, and thanks for choosing DevExpress. All right, just one little footnote I'm going to add before we shut down is, Rory, I'm going to send you this code ASAP. Yep. And, uh, and you can get it up there and so people can download it. All right. Thanks, everybody.